You get to the White House Correspondents' Dinner? I mean, you don't see the Central Park Five inviting me to brunch. Sir, are you sure you don't want me to go in your place? The press corps loves me and my Reese Witherspoon like Southern charm. Of course I'm going. What am I gonna do? Hold a rally to harden my ego before I watch it the moment I step off stage? That's great to hear, sir. And I'd be honored if you wore my clothes. Is Shepard Smith gonna be there? I can't believe some lucky lady hasn't snatched him up. <laughs> To truly understand the White House Correspondents' Dinner, you have to understand where the journalists in attendance sit. Tables. Tables didn't always look like this. Here's a table from 1415 BC. Scythia, I think. Looks similar to what we use today, flat top, leggy things down there. We'll get deeper into tables later. First, let's talk about what made them possible. The Big Bang. Welcome to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Hey, it's Donald J. Trump, or as you all know me, a source close to the president. <laughs> a lot of people complain that Washington is just a bunch of white guys talking to an audience who agrees with them. But I like Pod Save America. <laughs> now, where's the Sinclair media table? Right here, almighty Trump. The Tribune merger's going through. But tonight, we're really here to honor some great people. For example, Maggie Haberman. Remember that lunch at the Trump Grill? You got the scoop on my presidential bid. And I got the bacon cheeseburger and licked the ketchup lid. we go wrong? Was it when I called you a Hillary Funky? You don't play Stop pretending your paper is integrity. You work with Brett Stevens. You work with Brett Stevens. There's only so much a Rasmussen poll can do. Where did we go wrong? I've already lost Kill Me, and I can't lose Where you. Where did we go wrong? Maggie, 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 Please welcome Correspondents Association President Margaret Tollov. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. To those of you in this room and those of you watching across America, welcome to the White House Correspondents Dinner. In this room, we are Republicans and Democrats and Independents, people of all economic classes, races, religions, and gender self-identifications. My name is Margaret Tollev. I am Senior White House Correspondent for Bloomberg News and a CNN contributor, and I'm so very proud to serve as your President of the White House Correspondents Association. Before we get too far, I'd like to thank our cartoon president, R.J. Freed, Chris Licht, and Stephen Colbert for getting us warmed up tonight. And I think I, think I, can, I can speak, speak for, for all of us in this room when I say that we're sending our very best thoughts to former President George H.W. Bush tonight. He was, of course, a repeat guest at our dinner, and he's been recovering after his hospitalization and, of course, the passing of former First Lady Barbara Bush, his wife of 73 years. And I was listening to old tapes of 41's monologues uh, as I got ready for the dinner, and one of my favorites uh, was where he's talking about Dana Carvey's impersonations of him on SNL. And uh, if you guys remember, uh, President Bush had fa infamously taken this phone call from someone who he thought was Rafsanjani, the Iranian president, but it wasn't actually. And at the dinner, he joked that year that Dana Carvey's impression of him was so good that he'd actually asked him to go ahead and phone Rafsanjani and say, <laughs> he said, tell him it was George Bush. But uh, Dana said, wouldn't be prudent, wouldn't be prudent. <laughs> so to Poppy and the Bush family, if you're watching, we're thinking of you. I'd also like to acknowledge our student scholarship recipients in the audience tonight and our journalism award winners whom you'll meet later. This night is about you and what you've accomplished and the promise of what's yet to come. 
Yesterday, we held a luncheon for the scholars, and we paired them up with mentors, and then they got a visit from House Speaker Paul Ryan, who was amazing. He spoke eloquently about the role of journalism uh, and the next generation of journalists. And then this happened. The US president, the same one who has called American journalists the enemy of the people, welcomed these scholars to the White House. And he and his team rolled out the red carpet like they literally rolled out a carpet. And in the midst of this visit by uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, they gave them, uh, they gave these scholars an insider's glimpse at all of the kind of backroom passageways of the White House, the China Room, the diplomatic room, took them outside, lined them up on the stairs with that amazing view of the South Lawn and the Ellipse. And uh, then they were invited to meet with the president and with Vice President Mike Pence and to pose for photos. And the president and the vice president went to each scholar hand by hand, shook their hand, greeted them, who are you, where do you go to school? The president asked them if they were sure they actually wanted to become journalists. Uh, <laughs> but then he praised journalism as, and I quote, a great profession, and also asked how quickly they could get to work so that they could kick us out and replace us. Uh, after, the president's left, after the president left, I asked the students how they felt. And like a group of them all responsible simu simultaneously with one answer. They said, that was surreal. <laughs> and we nodded because we know the feeling. <laughs> Tonight is an important night for everyone who cares about good journalism. We're all here, all of us, because we cherish the First Amendment. We love the news and we believe in the power of reporting to raise up and better the lives of all people. That includes coverage of the White House, to be sure, and threats like international terrorism or Russian election interference. But it also applies to local stories all across the country. It applies to how we cover natural disasters and school shootings and the US gymnastics scandal and Me Too and pilots who pull off amazing disaster landings and save most of the people on board. Real news is sometimes happy, it's sometimes funny and heartwarming, and often it's heartbreaking or critical or makes you angry. But we reject efforts by anyone, especially our elected leaders, to paint journalism as un-American, to undermine trust between reporter and reader. <laughs> or to cast doubt on the relevance of facts and truth in the modern age. An attack on any journalist is attack on us all. This really isn't about the business of protecting journalism as a business. In fact, our business has all done pretty well in the last couple of years. It is about protecting a pillar of American democracy. The best leaders and public servants champion the First Amendment, even when the scrutiny is turned on them, and defend it at home and proclaim it overseas because they know that that helps democracy and freedom take root in places where violence, repression, and fear give cover to terrorism and corruption. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to remember journalists around the world killed for doing their jobs or who are alive but imprisoned. I'd also like to make a special mention of our colleague, freelance journalist Austin Tice, kidnapped in Syria in 2012. Austin, if you are somehow watching, there are a lot of people working to bring you home. I'd also like to remember some longtime veteran White House correspondents who we've lost to age and to illness over the past year. For decades, decades the Correspondents Association, Association members have invited a cross-section of people from public and private life to celebrate these ideals, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And this year, we also took our act on the road, beginning a new program with presidential libraries to connect with more Americans outside the Beltway. We began at the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, a great place, and we were met with a full house. Next month, We'll be at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. And if any of you happen to be out there, we welcome you to join us. Um, I'll also mention, since you all have your phones out tonight, that thanks to the board and especially to Zeke Miller and Olivier Knox, uh, we have a new and fantastic WHCA website live as of just a few hours ago. The new address is whca.press, and we look forward to serving all of you on that website in the months to come. U.S. presidents have attended this dinner nearly every year since Calvin, Coolidge, since Calvin Coolidge's days. Um, and that's a tradition that we believe will withstand the currents of time. Tonight, we welcome White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders to the head table to represent the administration. Thank you for being here. 
Sarah, we really appreciate your participation and your ongoing work with our members to help us cover the White House and to help Americans see their government in action. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome Aya Hijazi. You guys may recognize her from an amazing scene in the Oval Office about a year ago. Uh, Aya and her husband and two other members of their NGO were arrested by Egyptian authorities and bogusly imprisoned for three years. But she was freed last year after sustained media coverage and a sustained campaign by US political candidates and the current administration. Aya and her husband, Mohammed, who's in the audience with us tonight, also continue to advocate for the release of others, and they strongly believe that it was the press coverage, in addition to government intervention, that shed a spotlight on their situation and helped to build the leverage for their release. Welcome home. And of course, we have with us nice lady, Michelle Wolf. But more on you later. <laughs> I'd also like to call out all of my fellow board members, Zeke Miller, Alicia Jennings, Todd Gilman, John Decker, Julie Pace, Doug Mills, John Carl, and Vice President Olivier Knox, who will succeed me later this year and who will do a terrific job. Steve Thomar, our new executive director, has brought his passion for White House coverage to the job. Uh, no one can ever replace Julie Wiston, who's in the audience tonight, but Steve, we are so thrilled to have you aboard. And of course, George Lanner, the WHCA's attorney, who does an amazing, amazing job for us. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank the staff of the Washington Hilton, all of you. You treat us like family. We couldn't do this without you, and we appreciate you so much. In our audience tonight, we welcome many ambassadors from around the world who care about press freedoms, from around the world, ambassadors to the US, including, just to name a few, and there are more than a dozen in the audience tonight, the UK, Israel, and the ambassador from Bulgaria, Tiomir Stoichev and his wife, which is a pretty cool thing for me, a half Bulgarian girl. Blagodarya, thank you for joining us. We welcome representatives of some of the leading free speech and journalism advocacy groups in the nation who are here with us tonight, and some American baseball greats who joined us. I don't know whether you've had a chance to find these gentlemen, but thank you for your support and for being here. We also welcome many members of the Trump administration. Thank you for being here. And we welcome the leadership of the White House Historical Association several presidential historians, and representatives from the University of Maryland at College Park, whom we selected as our partners this year to build a pool report archives. This is an incredible project that all of the board and Major Garrett of CBS and I have been working on for a few years now, and we are thrilled that we'll be able to bring this live in, a, in the next year or two. There are some other people in the room who I'd love to mention because, as our president always says, it takes a village. But in all seriousness, please stand and remain standing if you are a past president of the White House Correspondents Association, a current member of the White House Correspondents Association, or the White House Press Corps. in the current administration or Congress or elected office anywhere in this country. Please stand if you serve in the military, if you run a business or work for a business, if you come from Hollywood, if you're a teacher, if you're a police officer, if you are a person who cares about freedom and the truth. As a personal privilege, I'd also like to take a moment to thank my editors and teammates at Bloomberg News, starting with Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite, with Wes Kosova, with Craig Gordon, 
with Alex Wayne, with all of the White House team and everyone else in the Bloomberg newsroom for the extraordinary support that they've given to me and to this organization over the past six years. And for your patience, I will be back to work soon, I promise. That's an amazing news organization. And I'd like to thank my dear family and friends and loved ones who are here to support me tonight. To my girls, Abby and Maggie, I'm so proud of you both. Finally, there are two people who I want to thank, who I hope are watching from the great beyond, my parents. Um, my, my father, Ilya Talib, was born and raised in Sofia, Bulgaria. And he and his brother escaped in the early 1960s because they feared for what their future would be in what was then a repressive communist regime. They came to the US because America welcomed them and because they longed for the promise that America held. My mother was born American, but like our current president, she was captivated by the drive and self-determination of a young, dashing immigrant. <laughs> my father was what I would call a George H.W. Bush Republican, and my mother was a Democrat, and they disagreed about a lot when it came to politics. And I became a journalist in large part because of those debates that unfolded at the dining room table each night. But one thing that they agreed on was that what has always made America great is the ability to disagree publicly, to have facts, to make informed arguments and the counter arguments for whatever the subject might be, welfare, taxes, war, religion, to speak your mind without fear of beating or arrest or seizure of assets or death. And journalism gives us the information to do that. My father risked everything to come to this country because of our ideals. And for him, the First Amendment might just have been the most important of all. As I see it, it's my job to do all I can to live up to that legacy and preserve it. Thank you. Please turn your attention back to the video screens. Good evening, everyone. Paul Ryan here. I'm sorry that the Correspondents Association decided against my idea to have the dinner in Janesville this year. So, unfortunately, I'm not able to be there with you there tonight. Instead, Jana and I will be spending the evening freshening up my LinkedIn page. Waiter at Tortilla Coast, 1991 to 1994. You know, I'm looking forward to figuring out whatever is next for me, but I'm going to miss sparring with the press every day. Baraboo. Sorry, somebody spilled out, not calling on you. Baraboo. In fact, Boredom is probably my biggest worry for life after Congress. Luckily, Boehner texted me the other day, and he said he found something that helps him chill out. It's something to do with grass. I, I don't really know. Anyway, I just wanted to say a quick word to congratulate the young men and women who are receiving scholarships this evening. I was able to visit with them yesterday, and it affirmed for me that the future of journalism is indeed bright. My message to the next generation of reporters, it's really simple. Know that what you do matters. There's so much noise out there, but our republic does not work without an informed electorate. Pay attention to the policy, not just the personalities. Look at the human impact, not just the horse race. And above all, Challenge yourself to challenge us, those of us in public office. Because what you do, it really matters. It provides transparency and accountability. Done right, journalism cannot just inform, but empower citizens. Of course, we don't always agree on what's right and what's fair, 
But that push and pull, that makes us both better. It creates a higher standard. It's part of the genius of this country, and it will endure through any turbulent time. So tonight, I say cheers to the First Amendment, and again, offer my congratulations to the scholarship winners. Have a great night. Thank you, Speaker Ryan. Don't forget your mandatory drug test. Uh, now, to introduce our newest scholars, the co-chairs of our scholarship committee, Julie Pace and Zeke Miller. This year's scholars come from 11 universities across the country, and we're happy to introduce you to them all now. Please hold your applause until all of the scholars have been announced. From Arizona State University, Ariana Bustos. From Columbia University, Hiba Dilwadi. From George Washington University, Devon Morales. From Grambling State University, Taylor Davis, the recipient of the Trust and Reporting Scholarship co-sponsored by the WHCA and Thomson Reuters. From Howard University, Harry, the, Maya King, the recipient of the Harry S. McAlpin Scholarship. Also from Howard University, Kyra Azor and Alexa Amani Spencer. From Iowa State University, Mary Kahn, recipient of the Hugh S. Society Scholarship in Print Journalism, co-sponsored by the WHCA and the White House Historical Association. From Northwestern University, Ricky Zip. Also from Northwestern University, the recipients of the Deborah Oren Scholarship, Oyen Falana and Ginny Hernandez. From Ohio University, Lauren Fisher of Cincinnati. Also from Ohio University, Jessica Hill of Akron, Ohio, and Kat Tenbarg of Cincinnati. From the University of California at Berkeley, Alondra de la Cruz of Newman, California. From the University of Maryland, Simrit Akilu of, Mer of Rockville, Maryland. Simrit represents four scholarship winners at Maryland. And from the University of Missouri, Alex DeRozier, Jamie Dunaway, Renee Hickman, Surin Kim, <laughs> Shanita Kathleen Martin, Jonah McEwen, Miranda Moore, Kara Tabor, and Rachel Wegner. Please join us in congratulating all of these scholarship winners. I've already told you a little bit about Aya, but I hope you'll turn back to the video screen so she can tell you her story. Hi, my name is Aya Hijazi. I'm honored and happy to celebrate the freedom of the press with you here tonight at this special month of April. Last April, your freedom to do your work helped deliver me the freedom to walk out of prison and become like you, a free person. For three years, El Sisi locked me and kept me hidden behind high walls with barbed wire. His regime told me that I'll spend the rest of my life in that morbid graveyard of the living, along with my husband and friends. You may ask, but what, how was he able to explain this tyranny to people? The answer was simple. Kill truth, bury it, create fake alternate truth, and place steel muzzles on mouths and hands of those who attempt to uncover it. Tell people that Aya is a terrorist and human trafficker. Yes, tell them that she and 60,000 imprisoned people like her are terrorists, not democracy defenders. With chains and guns, the regime was able to guard the secret for years that I'm not a terrorist, but a social activist. That seven years ago, and during Egypt's spring, 
I left my Juris Doctorate degree and flew from DC to Cairo to carry with me the values of humanity, freedom, and pursuit of happiness. That I helped cle clean garbage from neighborhoods and playgrounds, helped educate little girls, and saved little boys in the streets from being raped by older men on cold winter nights. But you may ask, how was I freed from this stifling rip? The answer is truth. If people bravely and defiantly commit to it, will break the strongest chains. Fearless activists continued to write about me on social media. A humane soul saw my husband loving, lovingly hand me flowers while we were caged on Valentine's Day, took a picture, and defiantly disseminated it to the world. The Washington Post saw the picture and wondered with distress, how do Egypt's most famous couple celebrate their Valentine? The answer was, behind bars. Then. My dedicated friend Chelsea Cowan and thousands of people here dropped a newspaper and demanded to know why is America leaving Aya and her husband to celebrate Valentine behind bars? Our president, Mr. Trump, responded, America's not leaving her, and here I am presenting her to you. And here I am, a living testament of your power to bring freedom, a freedom that is so viciously fraught, fought throughout the world. One of your fellow journalists and my friend Shokan Thousands of miles from here, is spending tonight alone in his prison cell instead of celebrating freedom of the press. And he's recently won UNESCO Freedom of Press Award with us because a dictator chose to bestow him with another title, terrorist. Don't be surprised. Dictators know that democracy dies in darkness. That is why they deem you, deliverers of light, as dangerous weapons. That is why it is so important to stand together tonight and celebrate your work so that you continue to shout out the truth. Thank you, journalists, for bringing light, humanity, happiness, and democracy to the world we share. We, the people around the world, need you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you also to Alicia Jennings for all of your amazing video work this week. Each year, our awardees are decided by an independent panel of judges, a process organized by Ellen Shearer. And now I'd like to ask Olivier Knox and Jonathan Carl to come up to the podium. Good evening. Uh, first, the Aldo Beckman Award, an award for presidential news coverage that recognizes a correspondent who personifies the journalistic excellence as well as the personal qualities exemplified by Aldo Beckman, the award-winning correspondent of the Chicago Tribune and former WHCA president. The award goes to Maggie Haberman. Listen to the judges. Maggie Haberman's White House reporting showed her deep understanding of what makes President Trump tick. Having covered Mr. Trump as a New York businessman for 20 years, she was able to tap that knowledge of his personality, business operations, and inner circle to chronicle the first year of his presidency. Her reporting was nuanced, contextual, and multidimensional with rich detail and authoritative sourcing. She often conveyed the feeling of being a fly on the wall of the White House. She also was a generous colleague who shared the fruits of her reporting with others at the Times. Maggie could not be here tonight, but Doug Mills of the New York Times will accept the award in her stead. First of all, quick shout out, Brooks Robinson is in the room tonight. Brooks Robinson is here. <clears throat> From Arkansas, as uh, our press secretary notes, uh, the Merriman Smith Award honors presidential news coverage under deadline pressure. 
The award is in memory of the late, great Merriman Smith of United Press International, a White House correspondent for more than 30 years. It is given in two categories, broadcast and print. The Merriman Smith Award for broadcast goes to Evan Perez, Jim Schuto, Jake Tapper, and Carl Bernstein of CNN. These, it's okay, these four journalists and a number of other CNN reporters broke the story that the intelligence community had briefed President Barack Obama and President-elect Donald Trump that Russia had compromising information about Mr. Trump. You may remember that story. Uh, the CNN team later reported the then FBI Director James Comey personally briefed Trump about the dossier. The judges called their reporting breaking news at its very best. The Merriman Smith Award for print goes to Josh Dossie. Josh's story about the resignation of White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer grabs the reader from the opening sentence. Dossie hustled to find a wide assortment of sources and wove a narrative that conveyed the drama of the resignation and held the reader's attention. While the resignation story was widely covered, Dossie reported details others simply did not have, beautifully reported and written, say the judges. Congratulations. And also congrats to Chris Johnson. Where's Chris? Honorable mention in the Merriman Smith Award, uh, Chris Johnson of the Washington Blade. Well done, lad. And I should mention, honorable mention, by the way, for the Merriman Smith Broadcast Award, Lester Holt of NBC News. Okay, the Edgar A. Poe Award, Edgar A. Poe Award nominates honors excellence in news coverage, of news coverage of subjects and events of significant national or regional importance to the American people. It is in honor of Edgar A. Poe, a longtime correspondent for the New Orleans Times-Picayune and a former White House Correspondents Association president. In selecting a recipient, the judges will be looking for excellence in stories with fairness and objectivity. So, the Edgar A. Poe Award goes to Jason Zepp, Peter Eisler, Tim Reed, Lisa Gerian, and Grant Smith, and Team Reuters for their report, Shock Tactics. The judges called the 18-month examination of taser-related deaths and litigation stunning, new, and disturbing. The series involved impressive reporting from multiple angles revealing the risks of a weapon that is not supposed to be lethal, but often is. The project, the judges said, is relevant to every community, stood out in a sea of powerful contenders. Congratulations. And the honorable mention for the Edgar A. Smith Award goes to, make sure I've got this right, um, Dan Diamond and Rachana Brahana Politico for their reporting on Tom Price's private travel. Congratulations.
and to Maggie and her husband and all of your family, we're thinking of you tonight. Um, I'd like to call to the stage in a minute the recipient of something called the President's Award. And this isn't something that we award each year. In fact, it's only the second time that we've done it. But the point of the award is to recognize excellence in somebody who helps our members and associations succeed. Martha Kumar embodies that. She's the director of the White House Transition Project, a board member of the White House Historical Association, and a professor emeritus at Towson. And as a scholar of the presidency, Martha's very special stats, among other things, record and analyze the relationship between journalists and the White House. If you don't know Martha, you can't miss her. She's a compact force of nature, whizzing by with a shock of white hair on a Vespa, or downstairs in the White House workspace with a pencil and a pad and amazing stats. She's regularly in the briefing room. She's always at the ready with statistics to help give our stories context and depth. She's a treasure to the press corps. She's a bridge between that first draft of history that we do and the many drafts that come after that. Martha, please join us on stage. Thank you for your important work and congratulations. First time I saw Michelle Wolf stand up, I thought, what is with that voice? <laughs> the second time, I just gave in and let myself laugh. And at some point, as I kept watching her, I thought, uh, this woman is actually saying a lot more in between the punchlines. Michelle Wolf is not always a professional comedian. She grew up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, ran high school track, and worked at Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan Chase first. Figures that's who a Bloomberg reporter would pick. <clears throat> She's written for Seth Meyers. She had a regular gig on Trevor Noah's show. And then, wow, that big HBO special last year. And right after we signed her for the dinner, we found out she was going to be doing a Netflix series. So <laughs> I don't know when she had time to do this, but we're thrilled that you did. She's not really a political comedian by training. She's not of Washington. But if 2016 taught us anything, it's that we should be listening to more people outside of Washington. And if 2017 taught us anything, it's, hey, that means women. So without further ado, please welcome Michelle Wolf. This is long. This has been long. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Here we are, the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Like a porn star says when she's about to have sex with a Trump, let's get this over with. <laughs> yep, kiddos, this is who you're getting tonight. I'm going to skip it a lot of the normal pleasantries. We're at a Hilton. It's not nice. This is on C-SPAN, no one watches that. Trump is president, it's not ideal. The White House Courts and Bond Association, thank you for having me, the monkfish was fine. <laughs> and just a reminder to everyone, I'm here to make jokes, I have no agenda, I'm not trying to get anything accomplished. So everyone that's here from Congress, you should feel right at home. <laughs> Now, before we get too far, a little bit about me. A lot of you might not know who I am. I'm 32 years old, which is an odd age. 10 years too young to host this event and 20 years too old for Roy Moore. <laughs> I know, he almost got elected. Yeah, it was fun, it was fun. Honestly, 
Originally, I never really thought I'd be a comedian, but I did take an aptitude test in seventh grade, and this is 100% true. I took an aptitude test in seventh grade, and it said my best profession was a clown or a mime. <laughs> well, at first it said clown, and then it heard my voice and was like, or maybe mime. <laughs> Think about mime. And I know as much as some of you might want me to, it's 2018 and I'm a woman, so you cannot shut me up. Unless you have Michael Cohen wire me $130,000. Michael, you can find me on Venmo under my porn star name, Reince Priebus. <laughs> Reince just gave a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, now, people are saying America is more divided in, than ever, but I think no matter what you support politically, we can all agree that this is a great time for craft stores. <laughs> because, of all the post, because of all the protests, poster board has been flying off the shelves faster than Robert Mueller can say, you've been subpoenaed. <laughs> and thanks to Trump, pink yarn sales are through the roof. After Trump got elected, women started knitting those pussy hats. When I first saw them, I was like, that's a pussy? I guess mine just has a lot more yarn on it. Yeah. Should have done more research before you got me to do this. Now, there is a lot to cover tonight. There's a lot to go over. I can't get to everything. I know there's a lot of people that want me to talk about Russia and Putin and collusion, but I'm not gonna do that because there's also a lot of liberal media here, and I've never really wanted to know what any of you look like when you orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> Except for maybe you, Jake Tapper. I bet it's something like this. Okay, that's all the time we have. <laughs> the Trump campaign was in contact with Russia when the Hillary campaign wasn't even in contact with Michigan. <laughs> it's a direct flight. It's so close. Of course, Trump isn't here, if you haven't noticed. He's not here. And I know, I know I would drag him here myself, but it turns out the President of the United States is the one pussy you're not allowed to grab. <laughs> He said it first. Yeah, he did. You remember? Good. Now, I know people really want me to go after Trump tonight, but I think we should give the president credit when he deserves it. Like, he pulled out of the Paris Agreement, and I think he should get credit for that because he said he was going to pull out, and then he did, and that's a refreshing quality in a man. <laughs> Most men are like, I forgot. I'll get you next time. Oh, there's gonna be a next time? <laughs> when people say romance is dead. <laughs> people call Trump names all the time. And look, I could call Trump a racist or a misogynist or xenophobic or unstable or incompetent or impotent, but he's heard all of those and he doesn't care. So tonight, I'm gonna to try to make fun of the president in a new way, in a way that I think will really get him. Mr. President, I don't think you're very rich. <laughs> like, I think you might be rich in Idaho, but in New York, you're doing fine. <laughs> Trump is the only person that still watches who wants to be a millionaire and thinks, me. <laughs> Although I'm not sure you'd get very far. He'd get to like the third question and be like, I have to phone a fox and friend. <laughs> We're gonna try a fun new thing, okay? I'm gonna say Trump is so broke and you guys go, how broke is he? All right? Trump is so broke. How broke is he? He has to fly failed business class. <laughs> Trump is so broke. He looked for foreign oil in Don Jr.'s hair. Trump is so broke. He, he, Southwest used him as one of their engines. I know, it's so soon. 
It's so soon for that joke. Why did she tell it? It's so soon. Trump is so broke. Uh, he had to borrow money from the Russians, and now he's compromised and not susceptible to blackmail and possibly responsible for the collapse of the republic. Yay! It's a fun game. Trump is racist, though. He loves white nationalists which is a weird term for a Nazi. <laughs> calling a Nazi a white nationalist is like calling a pedophile a kid friend. <laughs> or Harvey Weinstein a ladies' man. <laughs> which isn't really fair. He also likes plants. <laughs> Trump's also an idea guy. He's got loads of ideas. You gotta love him for that. He wants to give teachers guns. And I support that, because then they can sell them for things they need, like supplies. <laughs> a, lot a lot of protractors. A lot of people want Trump to be impeached. I do not. Because just when you think Trump is awful, you remember Mike Pence. Mike Pence is what happens when Anderson Cooper isn't gay. Mike, Mike Pence, Pence is the kind of guy that brushes his teeth and then drinks orange juice and thinks, mmm. <laughs> Mike Pence is also very anti-choice. He thinks abortion is murder, which first of all, don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> and when you do try it, really knock it. You know, you gotta get that baby out of there. And yeah, sure, you can groan all you want. I know a lot of you are very anti-abortion, you know, unless it's the one you got for your secret mistress. <laughs> it's fun how values can waver, but good for you. Mike Pence is a weirdo, though. He's a weird little guy. He, might, he won't meet with other women without his wife present. When people first heard this, they were like, that's crazy. But now in this current climate, they're like, that's a good witness. <laughs> Which, of course, brings me to the Me Too movement. It's probably the reason I'm here. They were like, a woman's probably not going to jerk off in front of anyone, right? And to that I say, don't count your chickens. <laughs> There's a lot of parties. Now, I've worked in a lot of male-dominated fields. Before comedy, I worked at a tech company. And before that, I worked on Wall Street. And honestly, I've never really been sexually harassed. That being said, I did work at Bear Stearns in 2008. So although I haven't been sexually harassed, I've definitely been fucked. <laughs> yeah, that whole company went down on me without my consent. <laughs> and no man got in trouble for that one either. No, things are changing. Men are being held accountable. You know, uh, Al Franken was ousted. That one really hurt liberals. But I believe it was the great Ted Kennedy who said, wow, that's crazy. I murdered a woman. <laughs> Chef Aquitic in theaters now. I did have a lot of jokes. I had a lot of jokes about cabinet members, but I had to scrap all of those because everyone has been fired. <laughs> you guys are going through cabinet members quicker than Starbucks throws out black people. <laughs> no, don't worry. They ha they're having an afternoon. That'll solve it. We just needed an afternoon. Mitch McConnell isn't here tonight. He had a prior engagement. He's finally getting his neck circumcised. <laughs> Mazel. <laughs> Paul Ryan also couldn't make it. Of course, he's already been circumcised. Unfortunately, while they were down there, they also took his balls. <laughs> yeah, bye, Paul. Great acting, though, in that video. Republicans are easy to make fun of, you know? It's like shooting fish in a Chris Christie. <laughs> but I also want to make fun of Democrats. Democrats are harder to make fun of because you guys don't do anything. <laughs> People think you might flip the House and Senate this November, but you guys always find a way to mess it up. 
You're somehow going to lose by 12 points to a guy named Jeff Pedophile Nazi Doctor. <laughs> oh, he's a doctor? <laughs> we should definitely talk about the women in the Trump administration. There's Kellyanne Conway. Man, she has the perfect last name for what she does. <laughs> Conway. <laughs> it's like if my name was Michelle Jokes Frizzy Hair Small Tits. You guys got to stop putting Kellyanne on your shows. All she does is lie. If you don't give her a platform, she has nowhere to lie. It's like that old saying, if a tree falls in the woods, how do we get Kellyanne under that tree? I'm not suggesting she gets hurt, just stuck. <laughs> stuck under a tree. Incidentally, a tree falls in the woods is Scott Pruitt's definition of porn. Yeah, we all have our kinks. <laughs> There's also, of course, Ivanka. She was supposed to be an advocate for women, but it turns out she's about as helpful to women as an empty box of tampons. <laughs> she's done nothing to satisfy women. So I guess, like father, like daughter. <laughs> oh, you don't think he's good in bed, come on. She does clean up nice, though. Ivanka cleans up nice. She's the diaper genie of the administration. On the outside, she looks sleek, but the inside, it's still full of shit. <laughs> and of course, we have Sarah Huckabee Sanders. We are graced with Sarah's presence tonight. I have to say, I'm a little starstruck. I love you as Aunt Lydia on The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> Mike Pence, if you haven't seen it, you would love it. <laughs> Every time Sarah steps up to the podium, I get excited because I'm not really sure what we're going to get. You know, a press briefing, a bunch of lies, or divided into softball teams. <laughs> it's shirts and skins, and this time don't be such a little bitch, Jim Acosta. I actually really like Sarah. I think she's very resourceful. Like, she burns facts, and then she uses that ash to create a perfect smoky eye. <laughs> like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's lies. It's probably lies. <laughs> and I'm never really sure what to call Sarah Huckabee Sanders. You know, is it Sarah Sanders? Is it Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Is it Cousin Huckabee? Is it Auntie Huckabee Sanders? Like, what's Uncle Tom but for white women who disappoint other white women? Oh, I know, Aunt Coulter. <laughs> We've got our friends at CNN here. Welcome, guys, it's great to have you. You guys love breaking news, and you did it. You broke it. <laughs> Good work. The most useful information on CNN is when Anthony Bourdain tells me where to eat noodles. <laughs> Fox News is here, so you know what that means, ladies. Cover your drinks. <laughs> Seriously. People want me to make fun of Sean Hannity tonight, but I cannot do that. This dinner's for journalists. <laughs> We've got MSNBC here. MSNBC's new slogan is, this is who we are. Guys, it's not a good slogan. <laughs> this is who we are is what your mom thinks the sad show on NBC is called. <laughs> Did you watch This Is Who We Are this week? Someone left on a crock pot and everyone died. <laughs> I watch Morning Joe every morning. We now know that Mika and Joe are engaged. Congratulations, you guys. It's like when a Me Too works out. <laughs> We also, Rachel Maddow, we cannot forget about Rachel Maddow. She is the Peter Pan of MSNBC. But instead of never growing up, she never gets to the point. <laughs> Watching Rachel Maddow is like going to Target. 
You went in for milk, but you left with shampoo, candles, and the entire history of the Byzantine Empire. I didn't need this. And of course, Megyn Kelly. What would I do without Megyn Kelly? You know, probably be more proud of women. <laughs> Megyn Kelly got paid $23 million by NBC. Then NBC didn't let Megyn go to the Winter Olympics. Why not? She's so white, cold, and expensive, she might as well be the Winter Olympics. <laughs> and by the way, Megan, Santa's black. The weird old guy going through your chimney was Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> you might want to put a flu on it or something. There's a lot of print media here. There's a ton of you guys. But I'm not going to go after print media tonight because it's illegal to attack an endangered species. By newspapers. <laughs> There's a ton of news right now. A lot is going on, and we have all these 24-hour news networks. And we could be covering everything. But instead, we're covering like three topics. Every hour, it's Trump, Russia, Hillary, and a panel of four people that remind you why you don't go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Milk comes from nuts now, all because of the gays. <laughs> you guys are obsessed with Trump. Did you used to date him? Because you pretend like you hate him, but I think you love him. <laughs> I think what no one in this room wants to admit is that Trump has helped all of you. He couldn't sell steaks or vodka or water or college or ties or Eric. <laughs> but he has helped you. He's helped you sell your papers and your books and your TV. You helped create this monster, and now you're profiting off of him. And if you're going to profit off of Trump, you should at least give him some money, because he doesn't have any. <laughs> Trump is so broke, he grabs pussies because he thinks there might be loose change in them. All right, like an immigrant who was brought here by his parents and didn't do anything wrong, I got to get the fuck out of here. Good night. Clint still doesn't have clean water. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for supporting the First Amendment and the free press, and we wish you a good night. Thank you.
the match her out. I mean, she just... <laughs> 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 